Okay, so my um, long-term research program uh, focuses on global transformations of citizenship. And this is what I've been always interested in. And I studied this historically as part of the nation building process, which I see as also a global uh, process at the height of the liberal world order. Uh, and then also with uh, regional comparisons of Europe and East Asia. And now I'm more interested in how the current neoliberal world order has come under challenge uh, by various forces. Okay, so, and in this talk, I'm um, drawing on a joint book project with my uh, long-term collaborator, Hector Ceballo Boado, that focuses on the globalized script of citizenship. As we were talking about Polish script of citizenship, but there is already a highly globalized script of citizenship, and there are the challenges um, to this very script. I would like to share with you analysis from one chapter from this uh, book that we are working on and some additional analyses from recently published journal article. Okay, so the global script of citizenship, this is, um, the script has been culturally framed and institutionally supported by liberalism. And then when I'm talking about liberalism, I'm talking about the way that it's shaped after the Second World War II at the, uh, through the very different kind of processes. Um, but I'm also really talking about the particularly a distinct version of this uh, or a variant of this liberalism, which is neoliberalism. And this is since the 1990s. Right? I mean, neoliberalism has been studied in vast extent in terms of its economic uh, um, principles, in the way that it structures the world order through these kind of very um, strong market orientations and all that. I move from that a bit. That's not necessarily what I'm focusing on, but I'm focusing on this kind of... Um, uh, what I call as neoliberal script of citizenship, which envisions a thick and strong notion of the individual. Yeah? A agentic, right-bearing, capable, with the virtue and consciousness of participating and contributing at local, uh, national, and transnational levels. And not only for their own uh, well-being, but also for that society. So this is sometimes uh, described as a global citizen, right? Uh, by, by many other people. But what I want to focus on this kind of understanding of the individual that became very dominant, and this model of citizenship, this kind of primacy of the individual, this thick view of the individual, is highly legitimated with the backing of international organizations such as the OECD, but also the UNESCO, for example, you know, the more cultural part of it, OEC, the more economic uh, understanding of this, uh, and their professional expertise. And as extensive research shows, also this kind of citizenship <coughs> model is widely adopted at the national level, educational policy and school curricula, and uh, textbooks, right? But we know much less about the enactments of this citizenship at the individual level. That is, to what extent this model, which is very much adopted at the transnational level by these international organizations, and also in school books and in schools, to what extent the young people engage with this model of citizenship? this agentic script of citizenship to formulate their self-projections and orientations regarding um, good and just society. So this is the question that we ask uh, and we take an empirical approach to this. Okay? And we use data from a unique multi-sided survey on higher education students um, enrolled in universities in China, Japan, Germany and the UK. And, and this uh, survey that we conducted, it has a sample size of about 9,000. The survey was implemented through a structured uh, sampling approach based on university ranking and size 
And in China, we additionally are stratified by provinces uh, because we wanted to take uh, into consideration the geographic inequalities in access to education. And the interesting thing about the survey is that it not only uh, span countries uh, from liberal to non-liberal political spectrum, we look at China and then uh, it also looks at collective versus individual kind of uh, cultural constructions that people usually talk about, uh, East Asia versus Europe. But also importantly for us, it includes simultaneously internationally mobile and immobile students. So we wanted to make sure that we understand not only students who are studying in you know, wherever their main origin uh, is, but also those who moved abroad. So it provides a good basis for assessing the comparative reach of this kind of identity citizenship. The focus on higher education is highly pertinent. Uh, firstly, higher education is a primary site for the construction of a self-conscious liberal world society and its citizens, right? Uh, as this is reflected in its teaching content, organization of knowledge, but also broader functions. So it's important that uh, for us, this is a, uh, the context that we are looking at is, um, has this kind of almost a mission to create this kind of uh, understanding of the liberal world society. Secondly, higher education is highly globalized, and this is exemplified by, for example, the worldwide predominance of um, university rankings. I don't know how much university rankings are talked about in Poland. I would be surprised if it wasn't talked at all. Um, but the important things about these rankings, from my perspective, is that they diffuse these kind of universalistic templates and expectations of not only universities, but also their faculty, their staff and students as capable, <coughs> purposeful and globally oriented entities. The understanding is that you know, everyone is equally, be, not everyone, every institution can be equally part of this kind of global uh, uh, field of higher education, sphere of higher education, and we as the individual members of this institution are uh, supposed to be taking part in that. Thirdly, higher education is increasingly massified between um, 1970 and 2015. Gross enrollment rates more than tripled as a whole in the world, and developing countries, but particularly China and also India, are the biggest drivers of this recent uh, growth. University students is increasingly a standardized category, not as elite as it used to be. So we used to think of university higher education as elite uh, institutions. There is some eliteness to them still, because as we know, not everyone ends up in, in I mean, there's certification, right? Access to, but in terms of the, again, conceptualization of it, we understand it not as elite, and, and again, you know, the enrollment numbers across the world is quite um, significantly increased. So if you want to understand the, not only the reach, but also the limitations of this liberal script of citizenship I'm talking about, really higher education is a good place to look at, right? Because as I said, you know, it is the place where this kind of self-conscious commitment to liberal society exists. I know there are challenges to that. Uh, we know what happens you know, in certain countries, including Turkey, for example, in, including Hungary, how the uh, states, the governments try to control that. But in general, there is this kind of a higher education uh, field. Is a, there is a, a commitment uh, to this kind of liberal world um, order. So in this research, we have a particular analytical angle. We are interested in the comparisons between students who moved abroad, as I was uh, telling you about, for their education. And these are students who are usually regarded as the winners of globalization, because they are the ones who managed to move. They are the international mobile ones, and those who stayed home. Yeah? And in the broader literature, we find two positions regarding the relationship between international mobility and globalization. The first posi position is that the experience of mobility is transformative. And 
It fosters broad, uh, argentic uh, qualities, often linked with this kind of idea of transnational human capital, for example. Or it also fosters cosmopolitan, solidaristic uh, affinities. A second position is that already those, those who, are, who are internationally mobile are a positively selected group of students, right? Uh, it just doesn't, as, as we know, migration theories are very much uh, uh, aware of in terms of the selectivity of who moves abroad and who doesn't. And this idea is that who are internationally mobile are already a positive, positively selected group on cultural and social capital and thus they are already more agentic, for example, and they are more inclined to cosmopolitanism than those are who are sedentary, who didn't, who hasn't moved uh, abroad or who, who are not uh, internationally mobile. But alternatively, and this is as a third uh, position, if the conceptions of um, agentic liberal individual are highly standardized across universities, across higher education systems the world over, we might expect them to pattern similar student self-projections and orientations, net of the experience of mobility, and also net of the uh, social backgrounds that independent of the um, cultural and social uh, capital. So these are the three um, positions that constitute the working hypotheses for us, um, for our analysis, which I will now um, move into. So it's, it, it, our uh, own interest is in this, really trying to understand, is that really the case that there is a global script of this citizen, this individual that we will find uh, more cosmopolitan oriented and more um, liberal in their orientation, right? as opposed to you know, the, those who move abroad, as opposed to who stay, for example. Okay, so in our um, survey, we have a, a number of questions uh, tapping into the specific dimensions of liberal citizenship. And I will focus on two. One is self-projections of agency. And the second is the global awareness and solidarity. Is, you know, as opposed to, for example, particularistic kind of um, identity attachments. So first, regarding self-agency, a battery of questions in our survey asked uh, to what extent the respondents identify themselves as someone who's creative, independent-minded, risk-taker, and achievement-oriented. These are the kind of... Um, uh, characteristic that psycho psychological studies usually treat as personality traits, but we do think that, and, and in, this is in following recent research in cognitive uh, sociology, that these are culturally constructed uh, kind of characteristics, right? I mean, so it's it's not going to this kind of understanding of a psychological self, you know, inherent in the self, but. These are um, constructed, culturally constructed, and this is how we understand these kind of uh, characteristics. So here are the panels showing average responses across our analytical student groups. And we use the response category somewhat very much that they identify, this is the top of the scale, how much they identify themselves with, with uh, description of the self. And in these um, and following results, uh, for the sake of brevity, I, I focus on comparisons between European and Chinese students and Chinese international students in Europe as a control group. I will mention the Japanese students only when they showed significant difference from the uh, presented results. So throughout these panels, we can see that differences across student groups are, if anything, very models and almost non-existent, yeah? And while Europeans on the whole score slightly, I mean, slightly above Chinese respondents, uh, the differences are quite small, only um, five to 10%. So about 75 to 80% of respondents in each student group identified themselves as creative, uh, independent-minded, and achievement-oriented. With the exception of being a risk taker, overall, 
uh, all students are less uh, risk takers somehow in this um, uh, kind of categorizations or oral characteristics. And overall, so we can conclude that there is actually quite a bit of similarity across student groups and independent of whether they move abroad or not, right? Whether they, so Chinese students, whether they stay or whether they moved, and in comparison to our control group of European students, we find that they are quite um, similar in terms of their self projections of being identic. As a second step, we merge all four dimensions into a synthetic index of agentic uh, individual. And these are the figures that show uh, the distribution of this index. And here we see, this is a more intuitive because we can see how much of there is overlap between uh, these different student groups. And again, you know, Chinese students are not different from European students. And this is figure on the left. On the left. To, to, to your right, yeah. And figure on the, um, in the middle. And, and then importantly, they are not that different from their co-nationals who stay at home. I mean, this, this, this overlapping uh, uh, distribution is, is quite uh, striking in that sense. But now I want to move to the second uh, dimension of liberal citizenship. That is the global awareness and universalistic solidarity. So these are, as I said at the beginning, there are two understanding that I'm, uh, there are other dimensions of liberal citizenship, but I'm uh, picking these two uh, in this talk. One is this kind of uh, a projection of self as a very agentic individual who can do things or uh, who see themselves as you know, similar across uh, the world. But then the second dimension is to what extent they are globally aware and to what extent they commit themselves to universalistic solidarities, right? That's also a second uh, important part of liberal citizenship. So for this, rather than asking individual affinities as um, national versus global citizens, which most of the general surveys do, uh, survey questions usually ask um, uh, to what extent people, you know, respondents see themselves as part of local, national, global. Um, we wanted to know their solidaristic commi uh, commitments as proactive individuals, because that's part of the whole agentic uh, individual, that individuals are expected to really act on this global uh, understandings of the world. So we devised a question for this, where we asked survey participants to make donations to very social projects located in different countries. Right? So the question asked was, imagine you have 100,000 uh, yuan, about 12,000 uh, euros, to donate to development projects. How would you allocate this among the following in different places? Right? So respondents had the option of deciding in percentages how much they give for each option, which specified a project in this specific location in Congo, Paraguay, Laos, and China. So all the places that are listed here, they are actual places, and they are some of the world's poorest areas, and they are actual uh, social projects in these places. So the projects that uh, we picked, uh, they were providing clean drinking water, building a primary school, facilitating sustainable farming, and building health infrastructure. So we randomized these answers because uh, it's possible that uh, individuals or respondents might have different kind of uh, affinity with certain kind of social pro projects independent of the place. But our interest is in which place they prioritize, right? Not the project itself. So that's why we um, uh, randomized the answers. So the projects were randomly assigned to the locations in the question. Yeah. So not every uh, respondent saw the same combination of uh, locations and, and projects. And as I said, this was to neutralize the effects of the social cause itself. Our main concern 
really wanted to see here whether Chinese students there abroad or in China basically uh, picked more uh, China-based projects, independent of what the projects are. So if the respondents were tuned with a universalistic solidarity, we expect them, expected them to allocate their donation money equally within locations, because it shouldn't matter whether it's China and other places, these are all important uh, social causes. So we would expect that 25% of their donation budget for each location would give to uh, these uh, locations are, that are in dire need of social intervention and um, independent of the kind of solidarities that would require social commitment to any specific location. That was important for us. So this is what we find uh, among British and German students. These are the European students and on average they indeed divide their donation money pretty equally across locations, right? I mean, all more or less 25%, a bit more, a bit less, but really that not much uh, different, a bit more than 25% uh, to Congo, a bit less than 25% to China, but really these are marginal differences. And now look at the Chinese students. A different picture. Chinese students donate the larger portion, 45 to 50% of their donation budget to the project in China. And that's very clear. And this is independent of whether they are studying abroad or in China. So going abroad doesn't change their donation behavior. They are, they are still uh, spending much, a lot, you know, 45 to 50 percent of their donation budget to uh, projects in China. So their solidaristic behavior or you know, solidarities are to a large extent nation bound. Yeah. So here is a very important caveat here. In our location and project selection, we were bound with the constellation of the projects addressing the most basic needs in world's poorest regions, which meant that we couldn't pick the projects in European countries. So there's a bit of a you know, um, mismatch here in that sense, that, that, because we could really look at the Chinese students' choices, but for the European students, uh, there's no national project in that sense, right? So, so we cannot really be that sure about the uh, European students' solidaristic kind of commitments. But I want to show you that in the sense that, that that's the you know, uh, European students' behavior is the baseline for us. If you know, we are thinking of them as the control group, doesn't matter that they are European students, but we want to make sure that you know, if in the case of donation, whether they would, uh, one way or another, they decided to uh, donate equally for all the countries. For that reason, we wanted to look more closely to the particularistic attachments using more direct uh, indicators. So in a battery of questions, we ask respondents' view of how they regard their nation's achievements in a number of fields, yeah. history, democracy, economic, scientific, and technological development, and countries' political influence in the world and contribution to the international aid. So the, the response categories range from not all at all good or to extremely good. So we're asking their view of how their countries or states are doing in these fields. And using a factor analysis, we created an index of these factors, which we consider as representing one's pride in their uh, nation. So what they think about their country, right? What their country is doing good. And here again, we find stark difference between Chinese students. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't, yeah. It's not as uh, colorful as I hoped for, but anyway. We find stark difference between Chinese students, the green bars, you cannot really, uh, the blue bars, you cannot really see. No, the green bars are not there, sorry. 
this is really not very good. Chinese things are not showing, unfortunately. Let me see. If I can move this. No. Okay. So I have to tell you, but the Chinese do look very different because, uh, again, here you find that 85% of Chinese students think that very highly of their nation's history, for example, and contributions to international. So th there is the, the uh, if you can, you cannot see it, but the Chinese students overwhelmingly think of their uh, nation as much more uh, contributing or doing very well internationally, and they're overwhelmingly proud of their nation. So I would like to show you the pride uh, dimension separately here, because otherwise you won't be able to understand where things are uh, moving here. So if you look at the Chinese, European, and Japanese students, the Chinese in green, uh, Europeans are uh, purplish, and then Japanese blue. And here are the responses to three of the uh, dimensions that we included in the index. How students regard the achievements of their country in history, international aid and democracy, and the last one is democracy, international is in the middle. Here, again, a large majority of Chinese students, uh, about uh, eight fine percent, think very highly of their nation's history and contributions in international aid. Europeans are much less enthusiastic, as you can see. And it goes down from history a bit more. It's international aid, much less. But democracy, they don't have any kind of uh, pride at all. Um, Japanese are sort of in between. 42% think highly of their nation's history. 30% uh, international aid. Democracy is the one where we see the list for all three groups, which I find extremely interesting. I mean, this kind of um, a group of higher education students and their distrust in democracy or their nation in terms of democracy is highly interesting. Um, and interestingly, we don't find much differences between Chinese students who go abroad and who stayed abroad, except international Chinese students are a bit more critical of their country's democratic performance, a bit more. So we don't have that here, but uh, a bit more they're critical of uh, their government's democratic uh, performance. So in a way, these results help us to understand which dimensions really contribute to this overall pride in, in um, one's nation. But Interestingly, they are not as easily interpretable when it comes to the whole script of um, liberal citizenship. So pride in history is conventionally associated with these kind of particularistic achievements. And it's interesting that actually history takes, gets the most uh, among all three, that, that you know, clearly even among European students, some amount of uh, students are finding it um, that, that their uh, history is something to um, be proud of. By the way, if we uh, divide this by the British and, and German students, Germans much less than British. I mean, this is the uh, combination of British and uh, German. Uh, but what makes this high is uh, among Europeans is really the British. Germans are much less uh, proud of their, proud of their um, history. Democracy and international aid, on the other hand, align with the ideals of liberal citizenship. These are not necessarily particularistic attachments, right? I mean, international aid is something that uh, would assume the kind of global commitments of states. Uh, democracy is very much part of the liberal um, script, liberal citizenship. So both satisfaction and dissatisfaction praising or being critical along these dimensions would be compatible with liberal citizenship. So it's not that clearly showing us that students are uh, necessarily not liberal or not enacting the kind of liberal uh, script that we are talking about. Actually, if they are critical equally, that, that they are uh, valuing the idea of democracy. So 
I, I mean, again, here uh, clearly the um, Chinese are much more nation oriented than their counterparts in Europe and Japan. But in their self projections, they seem to be combining these kind of orientations. So international aid, as I said, is something important. And, and it's important that they see China as doing something good. But they value that as well, right? So I should mention that for each of the analyses I presented, uh, we run further models controlling for a number of factors because, as we know, uh, gender can be important, parents, occupational and educational background, friendship networks, ranking of the university that they are enrolled, the province in China, the respondent attended high school, all trying to control for the individual backgrounds that would uh, count for social or cultural capital. But our results did not change. I mean, these results were very, very robust um, at the end, even after these controls. So uh, let me offer two points for discussion as a way of concluding. So first of all, sees show that agentic individuality, this kind of view of self, uh, very much uh, in line with uh, um, some kind of agency of the individuals, unlike global solidarity commitments, is very much standardized across higher education students, even in culturally collectivist contexts, as in China and Japan, and in status regimes as China, right? So this is clearly that, that the current higher education uh, field very much of assume these kind of individuals and individual students themselves see themselves as part of uh, this kind of identity individual. Um, cosmopolitan social solidarity, on the other hand, this is a concept that is rooted in more uh, collective philosophies of equality and also action, right? I mean, it doesn't assume, it, it assumes individual action and commitment, but as a, as a concept, this kind of social solidarity, it's collective, it is. It has a much more patchy and contested relationship to the liberal citizenship as well. I mean, if you look at the liberal script, the main emphasis is almost always on the individual before the collective. And even though school books and curricula emphasize an active global citizen, this is not matched with a defined global human society and its collective organization. So in school books, and this is uh, the other kind of research that I've done in the past, we find this kind of uh, the world and uh, students or individuals being part of it and, and commitments and all that. But that commitment is extremely abstract. So there's not a global collective organization. There's not a global human society as such. Can, that can be defined, right? At the end of the day, the collective that's defined is still very much a uh, nation-bounded uh, collective. So some of these collectives can be imagined around new social movements, for example, the environmental movement, let's say. But still, and, and this finds resonance with some youth, that's true, but still we don't find the globally defined collective as such, right? It doesn't exist in the liberal script as well. It's just very abstract. So that's one uh, way of thinking about this, and that, that it's not matched with a defined global human society and collective organization. So it's likely that, that so for that reason that we don't find really among uh, individual this kind of commitment. At the end of the day, it's, it's still the local that defines one um, commitment. But it's also possible that we can consider different kind of contestations of the neoliberal and neoliberal world orders. So as argued by several scholars, the liberal order that stamped much of the uh, post-World War II period is now under dress by different strengths, some with strong populist and authoritarian overtures, as in China, Brazil, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, but also in European and Western countries. So in, in Western European countries, this, as we know very well, that uh, some of these kind of populist moments are very much part of the Western 
politics as well, Western European politics as well. And with an agenda attacking uh, the fundament fundamentals of the liberal order and its institutions from liberal content of education to academic freedom to the legitimacy of the international organizations such as the European Union. So all these point to the authority of liberalism being eroding, right? That, that's one possibility that we can see that why uh, still, let's say in the case of China, for example, and maybe if we did this kind of research in Brazil, uh, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, that we might find similar kind of uh, commitment to the national as part of a challenge to the liberal script. But on the other hand, in the case of China, and this is a bit China specific, but it's possible that it's other um, countries as well. One important dynamic to consider is the timing and context of China's entry into the global uh, world. China is a latecomer in the global uh, world order, and it enters into the world after a long period of isolation, still has to prove and distinguish itself as a legitimate nation state, as one that is defined as a nation state. So, and it's trying to do this increasingly multipolar world. It's not a world of uh, cold war, it's not a world of only US hegemony, but it's an increasingly multipolar world where China has to find a way to make its presence. So it's really, I mean, China pushes a vigorous entrance with a strong global outlook on the one hand, but at the same time, it's a very valorized national identity. And this is very much the case, again, if we look at, for example, science and education policies. Um, they are soft and not very soft power diplomacy, for example. But if you look at their science policy, the talk about China-specific uh, science, China-specific higher education. This kind of talk is very much there. Even though when you look at the very content of these policies, you don't find much what, you know, what China is there. It's, it's more this kind of orientation towards China's uh, primacy, but not in terms of a different science or in terms of a different academic uh, understanding, as you know very well, China is one that really pushes, for example, these kind of global rankings. They are the ones which are really pushing the high, higher education excellence. If anything, they were the ones that created the global rankings in the first place. The very first um, world rankings were Shanghai uh, world rankings. So, so, but on the other hand, there is this definition of, you know, there's some valorization of this um, national identity. So, in that sense, China's nationalism shapes as a function of its globalization aspirations. And it's possible, very possible, that this is the kind of globalization we will see more and more, that, that this, this kind of valorization of the nation is a very global uh, aspiration. It's a very global process. It's a very global mission. So that's, I think, is important, and I want to emphasize that because there's so much talk about whether we are in a process of deglobalization, whether we are in a process of uh, uh, globalization dissolving. We have to think a bit more carefully, I think, when we see these kind of nationalist perspectives, right? So in this case, especially China, because China, more than any other country, uh, is really playing into a uh, leadership po uh, position in, in the world. And for Chinese higher education students, uh, positioning themselves as agentic global individuals, as we've seen, this kind of very uh, in line with the liberal script, but at the same time, nationally solidaristic citizens seem to be axiomatic. They don't find it as a uh, contradictory kind of self, right? They, they combine these, as many selves can do in this kind of identity position. So, so we don't find that, uh, in our research at least, we don't find that these are uh, necessarily conflicting kind of positions, right? A very cosmopolitan self, but very nation-oriented solidarity. And 
with the multipolar restructuring of the world order, the very possibility emerges that the script of citizenship will diffuse from these kind of multi-centers, which might be China being one of them, and it might really support these kind of heterogeneous and increasingly conflicting, but not necessarily, I mean, in conflicting in terms of the principles themselves but not necessarily because of the individuals, right? So it has a lot of implications in terms of how we think of globalization and what's happening to globalization. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much.